turn, number 403. Number 403, it's good to see each of you today. And as Rob often says, I hope you brought your singer with you. So 403 is my name written there. <laughs> Good. 
Number 393, and if you're able, we invite you to stand and the choir will march back. 393, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress <coughs> divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of to bow for prayer at this time. I'd like to ask Brother Bobby Miller, if he will, to lead us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this morning, for allowing us to be here and <coughs> sing these songs to your honor and glory and praise. We, we pray that you would be with the message this morning. We pray that you would be with our pastor. We're very thankful for him and for the many years he has been established here. We pray that you would have your Holy Spirit be upon us. We pray our hearts and minds would be open unto your word. Help us, Lord, to be a helping to those who are around. Help us to bring souls into your house to hear your word before it is too late. We do pray that you would be with those who have been mentioned for prayer requests, for those who need healing. We pray that you would be with them. We do pray that you would see us safely throughout our days and carry your coming. We pray that you would bring us back here tonight. We pray that you would see us safely throughout the day. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
don't know what it is about that deacon's bench, but it's hard to get out of than it used to be. So, But if somebody's put some more gravity in it or what, I don't know. If you'd like to open your Bible to Luke chapter 16, we welcome each of you. We were able to go to a preacher's conference in Kentucky Friday, and we didn't get to go till after dinner, but we were there and got to hear a preacher from Dearborn, Indiana, Brother Daryl Sparks, and also got to hear a preacher from Cynthiana, Kentucky, Brother Chamberlain, and they got to hear a preacher from Lynchburg, Ohio. So and we got to renew some old ties, and it was a good time together, and it's good to hear that there are those who are still carrying on the work of the Lord. We'll continue again, I uh, mentioned, uh, pray for Rob as he's dealing with COVID, that he'll not have any extreme uh, adverse effects from that, but recover. And also Lisa, it'd be good if she wouldn't get it. That would be the best that she could expect out of that. And then as we said earlier, ladies meeting is not in your bulletin, but it doesn't mean it's not gonna be. So it'll be Saturday at seven o'clock. And then continue to keep others in prayer that have needs. Well, we're going to read in verse uh, 19 of Luke chapter 16, and if you have your Bible, you may know this by heart pretty well already, but in Luke 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. By the way, Purgatory is a lie. It does not exist. So in verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou shouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. We're very familiar with this passage of Scripture. It's one that clearly speaks of eternity as the destination of all, either heaven or hell. And uh, you notice that these are certain people. As it says in verse 19, and verse 20, this is not just a parable. These are real people that uh, Christ was speaking of, and they still are. Uh, one of them's in heaven, one of them is in hell. And of course, as we mentioned about purgatory, after we read verse 26, there is no changing of a person's eternal destiny after they leave this life. And the teaching of purgatory is that you can change it. That when you die, you go to purgatory, and then if you have enough green stuff to offer, to get enough prayers, well, you can get out of purgatory. But God says you either go one or the other, and once you get to either place, then you're not going to change. Now, there are things beyond our understanding. Uh, we just kind of gloss over them. We don't really think in depth about them. But have you ever thought about eternity? Eternity, no beginning, no ending. We can't comprehend that. We, we can believe in it because God tells us. But then think about eternity in hell. 
Um, I, I really, uh, in my comprehension, it's hard for me to comprehend anything as bad as hell. I have burned a lot of brush piles and I've had to step back. I've had my eyebrows singed off. And to think about somebody burning in hell forever and ever and ever. I mean, that's beyond me. But I'll tell you what it does say. It tells us of the severity of sin with God in his eyes. And we should never minimize it and think that sin is not that bad. Because it is. And if it's uh, worthy of hell, then we know it's bad in the eyes of God. And eternity in heaven, <clears throat> that's one that is easier to think about. And oftentimes it's thought about too lightly and not considered to the extent it needs to be. But just to look at things and people as they are now does not really give us the proper view of eternity. And that's what I want to think about this morning. And when you look at verse 19, a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen and living it up every day. When you go down to the uh, verse uh, 23 and 24, he's in hell now, in torments, and crying out for a drop of water. So if you're looking at the rich man in this life, he's got everything. That does not really tell the story of what he is in hell, does it? And that's what I want us to also realize as far as Lazarus goes. In verse 20 and 21, he was so sick, he was not mobile. Uh, somebody else had to transport him. And the only food he would have would be what would fall from the rich man's table, his garbage, basically. I've heard men talk about being in war zones and see little children rooting in garbage cans trying to get food. Well, that's about where this guy was. He was depending upon the garbage in order to have some food. So that doesn't tell the story about him being in paradise with the Lord. Doesn't tell the story. So um, we're not going to be alerted to or really reach a right conclusion about eternity or what we need to do to be prepared for eternity just by what we're seeing and feeling. So I want you to grasp that thought. We're not in touch with eternity by the way things are now. We're not in touch with it at all. It may be completely out of our touch. You notice in the 28th verse, he says, I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. What's he saying? They're not in touch with eternity. And the only way to come to terms with eternal matters is from the testimony of those who are preaching the word of God. There's no other way to get in contact with it. You're not going to be in contact with eternity when you lay down in your pillow top mattress and go to sleep at night. When you get up and you've got all the food you want, you've got a nice car to drive, and you've got this and that plant, you're not going to be in touch with eternity at all that way. And these men were not in touch with eternity, period. So there are challenges to deal with. The more comfortable we are in this life, the less concerned we are about eternity. And that's what I fear in our day and time, that a person can be so comfortable in life that they don't even want to get involved in thinking about eternity and what that's going to mean. And then the more miserable that a person may become in life, you say, well, that, will that cure it? No, many times that just makes them more resentful and more bitter. So the only way to get in touch with eternity is if we really listen to what God has to say and what his word presents to us. So what was on the mind of the rich man in hell after he found out there was no hope or relief for himself was I don't want anybody to come to this place of torment. 
especially my brothers. I don't want them to come here at all. You know, uh, there's a verse in Isaiah that says, Who among us shall dwell in the burning fire? Now, that's a sobering question, but when I was growing up, church was a little different than it is now. Preachers didn't mind putting you in a spot. And they would ask you flat out, Are you saved? Raise your hand. Everybody could see those that did and those that didn't. But you're right on spot. Well, I think there is a question maybe. Is anybody in hell saying this about anybody here? I don't want them to come to this place of torment. If you're not saved this morning, there is somebody there saying that about you. They don't want you to come there. And they're very concerned about you. But the real concern is they're concerned that you're not concerned. That's their concern. So they want someone to raise that issue up. Now, he knew what had their attention because what had his attention? He was clothed in purple, fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. If he got a little scratch, he had a Band-Aid to cover it. He had a little tummy ache, he had all kinds of medicine to take care of it. Whatever it was, he was comfortable. He knew they were. They weren't concerned. They were not concerned at all. So it wasn't that they were miserable and bitter towards God, but they were just completely absorbed in the comforts of their lives. They were not ignorant of death. They were not ignorant of eternity, but it wasn't on their mind. It just wasn't on their mind. Somebody, even if this guy goes back from the dead and shakes him up, you know, sometimes people think, well, if there's something like that happen, well, that'll get people going in the right direction. But the message was, if they're not going to hear the word of God, then there's nothing that's going to touch them. They won't hear the word of God. There's nothing, nothing that's going to reach them. So there is a condition of not really knowing what you know. And I want to go to Matthew chapter 24 and read that. In Matthew chapter 24, and uh, <clears throat> there in the 36th verse of Matthew 24, But at that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Somebody says, well, why didn't God tell him? He did for over a hundred years. He had Noah, a preacher of righteousness. I want to go back to uh, 1 Peter, and there in chapter 3. When you think about Noah's generation, and it says they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Well, here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. You get that? During the days of Noah, as it says in verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. There's another verse in Peter that talks about that. So far, all the time Noah was building the ark, he was proclaiming God's going to send a flood and destroy this world, but the people knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They didn't know what they knew. And you know, that's really the way the devil likes to end our understanding of going to church. Not to know what we really know. Not to know what we really know. 
So <clears throat> you read here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. There's the title of our message, spirits in prison. Meaning the mind is not free to act upon the truth that one knows. The mind is just not free to act upon that. The mind is rather under the constraint of other interests and other thoughts. We can know about something mentally and yet not accept it spiritually. So not knowing what we know. Now I want to go to uh, some examples of this. In the 24th chapter of Acts, we have a man called Felix. In the 24th chapter of Acts, and there in verse 22, Paul, of course, has been rescued from being killed by the Roman government. And now they're having to deal with a guy that is innocent, but everybody is demanding that he be killed. So he's before the court in Roman, uh, of the Roman government. So when Felix heard these things, he was a governor, having more perfect knowledge of that way, Felix knew a lot about Christianity. He knew more than the accusers did. But he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the utmost, uttermost of your matter. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul to let him have liberty, that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, you know, Paul just didn't have a sinner's prayer to offer to him, and say, well, God loves you just as you are, and if you will uh, consent to these verses, I'll read you a couple of verses, and if you say, I believe those, and then if you'll just say a sinner's prayer, everything's good. No. He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. He covered everything about man's condition before God and man's accountability and man's need for salvation. Paul covered it all. So Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I remember where Felix was. And I remember when someone would call my name to talk to me about the Lord. Ugh, that was just something that was so dreadful. So Felix is trembling at this. You ever try to talk to somebody about the Lord and they won't respond to you? Or they just don't want you to do that? Well, that's the way it is when our spirit is in prison. So Felix, he knows but he's not really knowing. He trembled. That is, he knew about it, but his spirit is in prison. His spirit is in prison. So what had imprisoned his spirit? Well, verse 26, he hoped that money should have been given him. The love of money. You know, God says the love of money is the root of all evil. And sometimes people are so geared to that. Then, in verse 27, after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. He cared more about having the favor of men than he did accepting the truth. And, of course, anything that we care more about than the truth, that puts our spirit in prison, because only the truth can make us free. So here's a man. He's, his spirit is in prison. Well, <coughs> to kind of back up just a little bit, <clears throat> the rise of Christianity during the days of the book of Acts had become a major political problem for the Roman government. And like uh, any politician, you know, you never let anything go to waste that is a problem. You always try to make something out of it. So we go back to the 12th chapter of Acts, and there in verse 1, we find this is what Herod's doing. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. 
And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. The Jews' hatred of Christians was because they had rejected Christ. And Herod cruelly oppressed Christians because he wanted to please the Jews. Political advantage. So you can see what's happening. <clears throat> it has now become a political thing for the Roman government to get on the side of those that are persecuting Christians. So we come to King Agrippa now. This thing has uh, come on down the path a little bit and arrived at uh, to where King Agrippa gets into the picture in Acts 25 and verse 22. Acts 25, 22. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Because Festus said, we've got this prisoner and there's no real crimes that he's been indicted for, but yet everybody's calling for him to die. And he's appealed to go to Caesar, which is the Supreme Court. But he said, I don't have any charges to send up to the Supreme Court. And Agrippa said, well, let me hear him. You know, let me uh, also figure this out a little bit. So on, in verse 23 in Acts 25, on the morrow when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp. So here is this political thing now. And was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But I haven't found anything in verse 25. Nothing worthy of death. Nothing worthy of death. So, what do you find? The heir in this meeting is charged with political significance. King Agrippa, his wife, with great pomp, and all the big shots, they're all here. This thing has really got a lot of electricity as far as politics is concerned. And guess who's on trial here, Agrippa? Agrippa, everybody is watching to see how Agrippa is going to handle this. Because the Jews who are putting the pressure on the Roman government are going to respond to this. So he's on trial now. I don't think he really thought that was going to happen. But he realizes what's at stake uh, when this thing is, is presented to him. So in verse 1 of chapter 26, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself. I believe that Agrippa was an, um, probably one of the upright guys of the day as far as leaders go. He was very gracious to Paul, and he was giving him his rights to speak, being the accused. And I think that he tried to be a fair-minded person. His intentions were good because he... He really wanted to um, get some resolution for the Roman government, uh, definitely. Uh, and he knew that unless this thing turned out right, there was going to be a lot of repercussions down the road. So you could say that Agrippa was committed to jurisprudence. He wanted things to turn out the proper way, uh, in a lawful way that everybody could respect the Roman government because that's what he was. He was a government official. But what controlled the final decision-making of Agrippa? You notice in the 26th verse of Acts 26, For the king knoweth, all right, here we have knowledge, the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. You've got all the knowledge you need, Agrippa. 
Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Did he accept? No. His spirit was in prison. His spirit was in prison. So it wasn't what he knew, so, but it was a situation he knew not what he knew. And what he was feeling based on where he was in his life and his career is where his decisions were coming from. He was in a good position. He had a career ahead of him. He was comfortable. And so he did not want to disturb any of that. That controlled his decision making. He was a spirit in prison. Now you don't have to be a bad guy to be a spirit in prison because the world in which we live is in that state. You know, the Bible says a world by wisdom that doesn't know God. So <clears throat> they're in that state. Our human nature is also in bondage to sin. And if you notice uh, in the 26th chapter of Acts, Paul's testimony in verse 9 of 26 Acts, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He was in prison, wasn't he? His spirit was. But in verses 16 through 18, he tells King Agrippa about his conversion experience. God appeared to him. He accepted Christ. And then God told him he had a mission for him to do. So Saul of Tarsus had been a very religious man. He had lived, according to his own testimony, the strictest form of religion of the Jews. But he too had been a spirit in prison before he was saved. So you don't have to be a bad guy. Even after we're saved, we can let many things imprison our spirit. And I'm just going to mention names quickly. Lot. You remember Lot. What imprisoned him? The comforts of Sodom. The success, the prosperity. Achan, what happened to him? He saw a goodly uh, apparel and silver and gold. All right? Samson, what imprisoned him? Well, you know his story, how he wound up uh, becoming an immoral person. King Saul, what imprisoned him? His stubbornness. You have King Solomon, and you'll find that all his love for the many women that God said he should not, that imprisoned him. Uzziah, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. That imprisoned him. Jonah, his spirit of patriotism for his own country imprisoned him. And you go to Judas, you'll find he was imprisoned because after he woke up, he went out and hanged himself realizing what he had done. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, in verse 10, uh, Christ said that many will be offended. And in Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The great falling away, spirits in prison. Demas, in 2 Timothy 4, in verse 10, he forsook Paul because he loved the world. There were things in the world he wanted to do more. So, when it comes to avoiding um, our spirit in prison, there is one that I want to touch on that we really have to be careful of. In John chapter 21, and there in verse 20, <coughs> then Peter, turning about, seeing the, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Well, Peter never singled out anybody else but John. You know why? There was some feeling. In Peter there was some an element of personal feeling involved because John was so close to Christ so that created a little bit of a feeling there on Peter's part and so what did he come up with 
the fairness issue. Just not fair that I would have to go through this. What about him? What about him? What about the justice? What about John getting off, getting by, and me having to suffer? You know, when we take our eyes off of following Christ and we start focusing on people, our spirit is going to get into a prison pretty fast. And it's going to be a hard prison to get out of. We must not take our eyes off of following the Lord because we're starting looking at people. And what about this? What about that? Well, the situation of knowing but not knowing was something that Christ stressed that we need to be aware of. In Luke chapter 21, in Luke chapter 21, and there in verse 34 through 36, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, Watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that we can see in the Bible, God's people can get out of God's will. I mean, that's just a matter that you can see can happen. But one of the things that makes it different in the last days, <clears throat> when Christ talks about a great falling away, is that people are comfortable in life. And as it says here, your heart is overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and the day catch you unawares. So caught up in the comforts of life that the thought of dying without the Lord is not there. So caught up in the thoughts about this life that I'm not serving God, but that doesn't really concern me because things are going well. Things are going very well. How many people are in that spirit of captivity to where their spirits are in prison? You know, God tells us in James, the fourth chapter, and I want to read this. This will be about our last, uh, I trust that you'll read your bulletin. Very, very interesting testimony. And I've found that a lot of the songs that we sing, there's a story behind them. And a very good story that calls them to be penned. But here in James chapter 4 and verse 13. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. I want to ask you, do you have any plans? Do you have any plans made? And you're looking forward to those plans? All right, look at verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. The story in your bulletin, I'll just give you a short version of it. There was this preacher, he's the one who wrote the song, and he, his ministry was going well. God was blessing, so he was called upon to go to a certain place to preach. And this was back in the earlier days where they didn't have cell phones and means of communication. So his wife and children were dropped off at their parents at her parents, which would be his in-laws. They were going to spend a few days there and then come over to where he was. Everything good. Good plans. Well, in the nighttime, he got a knock on the door. A policeman came to his door and said, I hate to tell you this, but your in-law's house caught on fire and your wife and your children all died. So, what happened? his plans, everything upset. So what are your plans? All right, the rich man, he planned on living 
just like he had been living, he never thought about waking up in hell. That was the farthest thing from his mind that that would ever happen to him. And if you're not saved this morning, I just have the question for you. Are you ready to wake up in hell? That's what happened to him. He was so caught up in his life and his comforts that salvation was not at all what he was thinking about. Well, how about if you're saved this morning? Are you ready to meet your Savior just as you are? Are you ready to give full account for what you're doing? Will you hear him say, well done? You know, we can have our comforts of life. Things can be going well. And I was thinking about this. All of us know people that have gotten away from the Lord. I've got some in my family that have walked away from church. You know where they're at? All of them are doing well. They're all doing well. And what is the possibility of them coming back? Not very much as long as all is going well. Not very much. Not much of a possibility. Because when all is going well and we're not right with God, our spirit is in prison. You know that prodigal son? He didn't wake up until he was in the hog pen. Then he said he came to himself. He got out of that uh, spirit of prison and he came to himself. He said, I'm going to go back to the father. And he realized that the servants of his father had it better than he did. Well, God says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't allow yourself to be a spirit in prison. It can happen to anybody. Don't allow that. God stands at the door and knocks. He says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. So the plans that we have about life, what if they changed? What if your plans changed? What if your comfort zone was suddenly destroyed? And what if you were to wake up in hell if you're not saved? What if the Lord were to come if you're not saved? I heard one of the preachers, he had a very similar testimony to mine. Um, not the same, but it was very similar. As a boy, he knew he wasn't saved. So the thing that began to bother him was the rapture, the Lord coming. And he said, I knew my mom was saved. So he said, as a boy, he was not quite six yet. He said, I got saved when I was six. But he said, in childlike thinking, I'm going through my mind, that when the trumpet sounds, I'll run over and get a hold of mom's skirt. And so when she goes up, I'll go up too. And then when I get up there, they'll say, well, he's just a kid. Let him in heaven. But he said, I went to church and heard the preacher say, you cannot get to heaven holding on to your mom's skirt. He said, there went my hope of salvation. He said it was gone. Well, I'm asking each of us this morning, where is our hope? What are we thinking about? The only hope we have is what we see right here in the Bible. Everything else can very well just change like that. And all of our confidence, the things that we're relying upon, all of our feelings, they're not going to amount to a thing. It's just how things size up with God. May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray that you'll bless your word today. I pray that you'll speak to hearts because we know how important it is that we respond to you, that we just give everything to you. And if a person's not saved, it's so important that they just let go and receive the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart. Like Romans chapter 10 says, with a heart man believeth, unto salvation with the mouth confession is made. So thank you for the door of opportunity. 
Thank you for the power there is in you liberating us as we would accept the truth. And I pray that everyone here would want that today, to not be a spirit in prison, but to be free to serve you, to make every decision that your word says we should make and be blessed in doing it. For I ask it in Jesus' name.